Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Brian Radin. Brian is the president of ComData Prepaid. In his career, he has proven success with market leaders and startups across software, business services, human capital management, and finance industries. He also has an impeccable record of maximizing the strategic business model, optimizing business processes, and creating innovative initiatives that facilitate sustainable growth and generate traction in competitive markets. Brian has been recognized for identifying and securing key partners and sales channels, raising capital, building strategic C-level relationships with the investment community, and for developing highly engaged leadership teams that increased revenue, profitability, and customer satisfaction. Brian, thank you very much for joining me on today's episode. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, today we'll be discussing emerging emerging trends in payroll, as well as how finance and HR can work together to solve some of today's biggest challenges regarding attracting and retaining good talent. I'm really looking forward to learning from you. So let's get started. Sure. So as always, let's start with you and your journey as to how it is that you got to where you are today. It's a, uh, it's not a straight line. Let me start really there. Is. And, uh, and it's, it's taken me to a lot of different places and including places that we've intersected in the past. And, and it really, you know, the common theme in the various roles that I've had have all been about how do you uh, take an organization, create uh, a business and the products associated with that using great technology and great people to deliver highly satisfying had highly satisfying solutions for your clients whether they're b2b or in our case b2b to c with an employee or a consumer ultimately using our product and that began years ago uh, after I got out of business school at Wharton and working in uh, as a consultant and then in the cable industry and working for Comcast and building out cable services at a time when cable was a real technology that was out of the game as opposed to today, which it's uh, certainly not. And and at some point, I got interested in, in working in businesses and with businesses and focusing on human capital. And that led me to uh, work in strategy and acquisitions at ADP and really started to like this intersection of how people get paid and how organizations manage their workforce. Um, and one manifestation of that was I started ADP's PEO business, and then I left to start my own and did that for quite some time and uh, really learned quite a bit about how you not only uh, look at technology and solutions and products for the small business market, but then how do you deliver those? And uh, and also how do you sell them even more importantly? I did that for quite some time and sold uh, my half of the company and went on to continue to follow a path that led me to uh, global payroll, which is another really interesting space and uh, was the president of uh, CloudPay, a global payroll software solution and did that for several years. And again, was continuing to look for other opportunities where I could help scale, grow a business, and was recruited to come to Fleet Corps. And Fleet Corps is a public company uh, trading uh, on the New York Stock Exchange, about $14 billion in market cap, down a little bit like everybody else these days, but a very successful company that really started in the fuel card business, but has expanded into corporate payments and lodging networks and had a business in the prepaid space that was primarily a pay card. And that business was sitting within our corporate payments division when uh, the CEO here, who I knew from ADP, had recruited me to come in and say, hey, can we make this into a more valuable business and grow it in a way that we can deliver not only basic pay card solutions, but enhance that product and also look at other ways in which we can use our application to sell to our customer base or provide to our customer base, and then have a way to manage all of those people on the other end who get a card from us and help them understand how to use that product more effectively. And so 
I came here in 2018 as the president of our prepaid division, and I have been here uh, building that business ever since. And so you're going on five years now. Can you talk to us about what your proudest achievements are since since joining Fleet Corps? Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting question uh, because you know in some ways there's some answers that feel good. Hey, we've grown the business. We're bigger despite COVID. Uh, we've hired some really great people to help build the business, whether it's sales, marketing, operations, so a lot of people stuff. We have a much better mobile application and technology than we did when I got here, built a whole brand called FinTwist, which I know we'll talk about. I think for me, it's really, though, being much more customer-centric and focusing in on why people actually want to use our solution, why employers want to offer it to their employees, And then being able to evolve and the world is moving at a very fast pace, both from technology and the environment in which we live in, in a way that we can continue to meet those demands and we can continue to achieve the kind of success that we had um, when I got here. And I think the measure for me would be our net promoter score for customer satisfaction. Uh, When I got here, the business had a NPS of a four, which anybody who runs a company and does any customer sat knows it's not very good. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, when I went to the global payroll company, when I got there originally, it was a minus 15. So I'm not used to it. Uh, and then our, at the end of last year, our NPS was about 40. Wow. And so I, will, I think that really speaks to the quality of our services, the level of satisfaction at the customer side. And to do all of that, you've got to have great people, better technology. You've got to stay attuned to what's happening in the market. And I think in a unique way, during COVID, you had to deliver what I'll say is more handholding for a lot of companies that were facing some very difficult decisions around people and operations. And I think we came out of that feeling pretty good and our customers feeling pretty good about us. So while there's a lot of things that I think we've accomplished as a team within Fleet Corps in this business, I think that one probably stands out to me because I think it's a reflection of the progress we've made as a business. And it also, I think, has helped us retain many, many customers. And while they're smaller than they were due to COVID, they're still working with us. They're still on our on our role, so to speak, and we're still delivering services to them. Well, congratulations. Those are some amazing achievements. Um, It seems like historically payroll has been an area that's slow to innovate. So what initially drew you to this space and what keeps you excited about it? Uh, I get get that asked a lot of my, let's say some of my friends from from Wharton or or in business. And uh, they say, wait, you like dealing with people's stuff around payroll and taxes and making sure that it's accurate and and how they get paid. That seems really mundane and also regulated at the state levels and and in some cases at the the CFPB. That just doesn't seem very exciting and uh, interesting. Uh, And so maybe in some ways I'm a a little nutty. But to me, what I like about it is that it, it really strip away that it's payroll. Or any business, and I've been, I've worked in everything from a companies that created Lady Swimwear to PEO services to cable services to supermarkets in the variety of roles that I, I didn't mention in that jagged career path. Um, but this is interesting because it it really touches w- what I like about business, which is kind of the intersection of technology and service. And yes. The payroll community, which sits probably about 60% of the time within your constituency, CFOs, although many of them will forget that the payroll department's down in the basement and it's very different than the the things that they think are important sometimes, is, um, is the fact that it can be innovative and it has, and it touches everything that really matters in an organization, in my opinion, unless you're purely you know, making a widget, so maybe the product is, but it's people. And if you don't 
manage those people, remunerate those people, compensate those people, provide benefits for those people in a way that is satisfying, simple, uh, and meets the needs that they have, whatever job they have, it's going to disrupt your workforce. And certainly the last few years, we've seen that from an external stimulus with COVID, but it was happening and it's been happening for years. So for me, it's this intersection of people, but then how do you use technology with people to drive greater customer satisfaction? And one of those places where I like to do that is in kind of payroll, HCM, and payments. And because it really does utilize all of those elements. And sure, could I go sell SAP, you know, supply chain software or, or Oracle or whoever a lot of large companies use, uh, or go sell Workday or Success Factors or whatever? Sure. Those are parallels, but most of that is SaaS software. And I also am a bit of a masochist because I, I like to work with organizations like ours where while we use technology to enable, we use technology to satisfy, we use people to retain. And I've always looked at having strong service teams, having strong organizations is really a way you can differentiate yourself with your competitors, assuming that your competitors are also using people to support their business. And, and so this, this element of technology and services, this intersection um, is really a place that I enjoy and payroll is a place that that is absolutely critical and important. And let's talk about FinTwist solutions. So what exactly is FinTwist? It's a figment of my imagination. Again, I made it up sitting in a conference room in, in Nashville. Now, we actually spent a lot of time uh, developing a brand uh, before we had FinTwist, which really is the, the brand for all of the prepaid programs and our mobile and our earn wage access program, FinTwist On Demand, we had a we had a pay card. In fact, ComData invented pay cards uh, about 37 years ago. And I went even in my PEO, I remember using them. And very typically back then it was because we had a lot of people in some of these small businesses who didn't have a bank account, they couldn't get paid. And then people were still using a lot of checks, but 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 businesses were getting smarter. They didn't want to keep pushing paper out. And payroll companies were charging them more money for checks than they were for electronic pay. And so pay cards came into being and Comdata uh, invented them. When I got here, our product was functional, but not very good, frankly. And we realized that it's evolved. The whole industry's evolved. The product's evolved. And we needed to create a brand new veneer. And we needed to create new attributes. And then we had to do the hard part, which was then changing and building out new technology to put in the hands of our clients and their employees. And so to do that as like the Com Data Pay Card or the Com Data Program really didn't feel very fulfilling to me. And so we uh, spent some time looking at different ways to go to market, different branding techniques, and and kind of different brands themselves. And we started with Fintwist. So we rebranded all of our generic com data materials, but more importantly, we embarked upon a path to create this FinTwist technology, which was a change, to change what we did from when we did it, to take the history that we had, which I think is important, because we know the space, but then to twist it around and use it in a way that's more uh, consistent and current with what's going on in the market. And that's really where the brand came from, and uh, it represents everything we do, not just pay cards, but other programs that we provide uh, to our clients as well. Um, give us an overview of what a pay card is and how it's more financially inclusive. Yeah, so basically, as I said, a pay card, and, and in some ways it still has a lot of the same attributes that it had when I signed up with the company and it might very well have been Comdata. I just don't remember so long ago. Uh, that they essentially, their clients needed a product that would give their employees a methodology to get paid that wasn't a check and didn't need a bank. It was very basic. And so essentially, they started with this debit card that would take a load or a payment, your payroll, 
instead of it going to your direct deposit account or check and you'd have a pay card. And it really allowed you to get your money at an ATM. And that was really what the original pay cards did. But over time, as the world changed and companies moved away from checks. So today, about 20% of Americans or workers get paid. Some are part-time, some are full-time. Let's just call them W-2s. Get paid on a pay card, which some people go, wow. I mean, I'll tell people that they go, what? I didn't even know what it was. And it seems like a lot of people. Other people will say, gee, that's not very many. But the relative term would be the balance, about 70% get direct deposit. And around eight to ten percent are still getting checks, and that number continues to decline until it reaches some number, probably five percent, where somebody will always want to check, and whether it's dictated by a union or a government entity or some other pro other type of employer who just doesn't want to bend to the will of the electronic world, they'll throw some checks out. But for the most part, it's DDA and then pay cards. And, and what happened was more people started to see a benefit of using that product, but not just getting a debit card with my pay on it. And so the product began to evolve. But what's interesting is still there are about 24 million uh, people that are underbanked and minorities make up a much higher percentage of the people that are underbanked. And so for them, if your company suddenly doesn't want to provide a check, and in multiple states now, you can dictate electronic pay, how am I going to get paid? I don't want a bank account. The average bank account, a very recent study, it's about $3.90 a week is what it would cost to have a bank account, whether it's minimum fees or other fees associated with the account. So to provide a product that individuals who are unbanked or underbanked, particularly uh, minorities, that would give you the ability to make sure everybody got paid. On top of that, the product itself, moving and evolving from this debit card, is a, is a credit card. It's a debit. You can use it for your Venmo or your, your P2P type payments. You can do bill pay out of it. You can use it at an ATM. You can go to a MasterCard bank or one of our partner banks, use the card for free to get you know, payments, to get your cash or to get money at the teller. And so it becomes very inclusive because you can use it. And while there are some nominal fees on the program, there's literally a way that's very easy to get charged nothing. And, and we have a large percentage of our users in the multiple hundreds of thousands that pay nothing for the card. And in terms of the employer, the employer receives the pay card program for free. So there's no cost to them. Uh, it's a pretty simple implementation process. And once they're up and running, they're not paying anything and a percentage of their employees are paying nothing. And the others are using it in some way, sometimes as a convenience. So, you know, I Citibank, let's say if I have a Citibank card and there's a Citibank on Fifth Avenue and I live on First Avenue, but there's a Chase Bank on First Avenue, I may decide because I'm lazy, you don't want to walk to the Citibank. I'll just go to Chase and Chase will charge me $3.50. So it's a convenience. So there are convenience fees, but there's alternatives where there's no fees. And so therefore somebody who doesn't you know, want to pay a fee and needs to get paid, this, this product allows them to do it. Just curious, how, how do you guys make money off this product? So there's two places. I mean, one is on the people that do have a convenience fee, there's a piece of that. And then um, because we obviously have to pay MasterCard uh, for all of the transactions. But there is some small percentage of interchange that uh, is shared back with MasterCard to to uh, the company that provides the pay card. And that's primarily on credit transactions um, versus debit transactions. Very, very, but a much, much very low percentage, for example, but, but different, let's say, than a corporate payments program, which is a very part of our business, our core pay business, or others like Amex or Capital One or the banks, when you're getting a company to move all of their AP payments to a virtual card program or a, even a plastic program still, the split with MasterCard is better um, because a lot of that money goes back from, let's say, Comdata or CorePay back to the employer. So a lot of clients can fund their whole AP function or, or elements of their, you know, the CFO's office through rev share 
by getting their clients to start using, let's say in our case, MasterCard, and that share comes back to them. That's a bigger program. It's a bigger dollar piece um, than it would be on uh, on a pay card program. And um, the concept of on-demand pay, that, that's pretty new to me. Has that been around for a long time? You're just not paying attention, Meg. <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. It's not been around a long time. Uh, it's been around as an idea for for many years, even, you know, I go back at least eight or nine years when I was uh, president of CloudPay. Uh, I knew this stuff was going on, but there was a lot of questions around how it worked and would it work and how is it regulated and, and all the kinds of stuff that you would think about when you're talking about something that affects an employee's pay. Uh, and so it really began to take off, I would say, about three to four years ago. You started to see people talking about this idea of why would I have to get paid every other week or once a week because a lot of people need their money now. And, and obviously that has changed um, even more so. You know, you've got about 40 percent. Um, of Americans who couldn't even cover an expense of four hundred dollars out of their out of their account, whatever that account might be, we estimate, based on research, that about eighty percent of Americans are living check to check. Well, even check to check doesn't mean living biweekly or semi monthly or even weekly. It means living on a day to day. And so this concept of hey, can I get money faster, assuming I've worked, because it's owed to me anyway. It's not like, hey, I'm I'm fronting you money. It's not a it's not a payday loan. It's not a regular loan. It's not a, a cash advance even or a pay now buy now pay later scheme. It's literally I worked. It's your limitation as an employer or or the way in which you want to pay me, which also leads to you know they get cash flow and some other things on those although nominal. Are, are interest on those huge volumes. They they just don't want to pay me, or they don't want to pay me, but every week or every other week. And so this concept of hey, why don't we <clears throat> pay people on demand, or you'll hear, or earned wage, became more and more interesting. And like a lot of the fintech that's gone on over the last you know 10, 15 years, a bunch of smart people started creating technology that I'll just say, for lack of a better term, bypasses payroll in a way where the employer doesn't really get impacted. And they then use this software platform to calculate based on feeds from payroll and time systems, what Megan has earned. And I'll let her take on demand what she's earned now. Oh, and by the way, where a big evolution has occurred in this, and there's something like, I think I've seen something like 50 billion dollars, 50 billion dollars last year of EWA transactions, something like that, it's really huge, is I'll put the money out for the company. So not only if if it's your company and you don't want to change the way you pay payroll, I, I have a weekly system and that's it. I don't want to do it any different. That's okay. You don't have to. And two, when people want their money, we'll put the money out for them. And then when they get paid on payday, we'll take out what's owed to us, and we'll pass back the rest of it to their pay card. And so it became then much easier because the original models were very intrusive. It was kind of like when you would run a payroll every day. It'd be like, you're living in California and someone's quitting every day. You got to keep running payrolls because you got to pay them that day. And that was interfering with the payroll departments and people didn't like that model. And that was really the original model. It became much more popular and really started to take off when you could essentially float that money. Now, the, the, the risk there, obviously, is who's floating the money? What's the nature of that organization? There are, by our last count, 50 of these platforms floating around. And only a handful, in my opinion, uh, including ours, obviously, has the financial wherewithal to be comfortable in floating literally millions of dollars of payroll in advance of somebody's pay. Because the risk is that pay, even if you're getting feeds, is impacted by garnishments or other elements, or the employer goes away. And obviously, the farther down market, just the math tells you, the smaller the business, 
the higher likely that business would not survive or will not survive. And therefore you're stuck because you've paid out that money and you really have no recourse because to be a provider and to be accepted, at least in the current world of the CFPB, you can't debit money from a credit card. If for some reason you don't get your money back, you can't go to look at credit reports to decide whether you're going to do it. This is literally an administrative service. And as part of that service, you're fronting money. Otherwise, you could then be a lender. You have to be registered in every state. And there's still a lot of questions uh, with the state payroll rules and the CFPB with some of these models as to whether they're really service providers or whether they're really lending money and how they should be regulated and whether they should be regulated. And I think you'll see quite a bit of shakeout in the next couple of years with these models, providers, I should say. But the core model pretty much here to stay. And whether the payroll companies just evolve and some already have that capability, but don't want to offer it directly, or some may, obviously it's a it's a component of payroll to some degree. Uh, I think that may change. It'll evolve. Some companies will never be able to front the kind of capital they need to, and some of them will get regulated away. But the pure concept of paying somebody as they earn it, that's here to stay. Yeah. It's a really interesting concept, and I'm sure it's exploded in the last two plus years. Absolutely. That's what I was saying. The model, I mean, I think I saw $50 billion worth of EWA-related transactions, and this just, you know, as you know, when people see entrepreneurs and investors see opportunity in the space and they see other companies growing, there's always the next team that wants to jump in. And, and we've seen that. And as I said, we see, I've counted more than 50 domestic, but around the world, I have a list of over a hundred total providers. I mean, it's the same way They're, they could be unique to India or the UK or the Philippines. So there's, it's really interesting how the basic idea of I've worked, pay me now has become a kind of a core mantra. And frankly, here, especially with larger enterprises, which is where most of the providers have been feasting because it's lower risk and a lot more people who would have interest. Um, it's become a core element of how they recruit, and how they retain employees. Uh, and I think you've got to be careful as an employer in offering this. I mean, for example, in our case, to your point about inclusion and financial wellness, which I take very seriously, we don't allow uh, employees, we use our product to take more than 50% of their wages every time they use the service. Now, we could offer them more. A lot of people, a lot of these companies will say, you can take everything. One, the type of person using it is more of the lower income. I don't want to say click people without income. In fact, a lot of people use our card or making you know, decent money but they're scrapped. You know, they're they're really strapped, I should say. They're for for cash and they're strapped to make their bills, you know, this living check to check. So so the idea would be, look, but we also don't want it to be every day I want to go and I need to pay my rent. It's a great reason I'm gonna pay my car payment. Going to the store and buying cigarettes or or buying something that you could probably wait on starts to get into a habit that I don't want to be the one who's driving that habit. And one way you do that is manage the the amount of money they can take on demand. And, and that's just one element. Others will tell you, well, let the consumer decide what they want. They want to take 100% of their pay, take 100% of their pay every single day. I work a shift, I take a pay. I work a shift, I take a pay. To me, that creates, I think, bad financial habits and is in is in contrast to our objective of trying to create better, smarter users of our product so that in the long term, they can have more financial freedom than they have today. And let's talk about the current labor market. So we all know that labor is is very scarce these days, but how can things like Bintwist and on-demand pay address some of these hiring and retention concerns? Look, I'm not going to say, you know, I've talked about this a lot. This is a component of it. I've been advocating higher minimum wage. I've been advocating broader access to health care and other related benefits. Um, I've been advocating long before uh, COVID, more flexibility in how people work. 
particularly in the industries where we're prevalent. So if, if I was to tell you that 80% of the people that use our product are working in retail, staffing, hospitality, and manufacturing, that would be maybe even low. So these are people that are typically hourly. Um, there's a kind of a barbell effect. You've got some older people, like the ones that work in manufacturing lines and and may have uh, or, or working second jobs in, 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 the, in the retail or staffing side. And then you got a lot of Gen Z, you know, new people in the workforce, people working in restaurants and hotels and places like that who are younger, who frankly never had a bank account, never will. I mean, there's, you talk to somebody under the age of 30, I'll bet you nine out of 10 of them don't even have a checkbook, don't even have a check. They don't even know where to write a check. So you, you've got a, a different type of human being that's using the product in different ways and come from different places. You have some people that come from places of struggling, needing a way to get paid, wanting something that they can use at an ATM or get cash. And they have others who are really using it to you know, pay their pals because they all went out and drinks and they have to Venmo everybody or using it to pay something through debit or credit. Occasionally, they might get cash if their dad bothers them and they got to reimburse them. So maybe they go get some cash. So it's not um, it's not a one kind of person uses it within our community, but the community is a lot of those kinds of uh, of those individuals. And as you well know, when we talk about what's happened in the, in the labor markets, the kinds of companies that we deal with have changed and have changed forever. There's absolutely no doubt about it in my mind. And they were starting to change a little bit before. They were getting a little technologically smarter. There's much more software that, that's that been developed in this market around integration of POS and integration of payroll and ACM into financial applications. And I think what accelerated that when COVID hit was, look, I, I have to be cheaper. I have to be leaner because demand became non-existent for a period of time. And as they started to come back, because they had to lay off a lot of these people, they didn't, uh, people weren't coming back because I can't work remotely in my apartment if I've got to be cleaning a room at a Marriott or serving a table or working in the kitchen or standing on a manufacturing line. And so what ended up happening, you had this whole displacement of of, uh, the labor market, which is pretty well documented, but significantly in our space. And so even today, the whole hospitality space, while maybe half of it's come back, there's still some number I saw, there's a, like 1.5 million open jobs at any point in time. And so what's happened is that company, that let's say that Marriott hotel that had, let's say eight maids working in the hotel cleaning rooms that went down to two during COVID, and now they're running it at four. Well, how can they do that? How can they deliver services? Well, because you, the consumer, you don't even have the expectation that your room gets cleaned every day anymore. You don't even expect it because you didn't during COVID. And so consequently, I can operate that with four maids. And so those four people is all I need, but I still can only recruit three because the market is so tight. So many people disappeared, still working the money they got from the Biden and and Trump payments, or they're deciding they don't want to work in that environment. They're working from home. Uh, Others, have shifted jobs that give them more flexibility, better pay, um, and some of the benefits that um, I think people need to to have a better work-life balance. And so what do I do? Well, I've got to start recruiting. And a lot of companies are having to recruit. You know, I'm not talking about a single hotel. I'm talking about volumes of people. And most employers, maybe you've seen this in, in the things you've done over the years, they're just not great at recruiting. And they're not great at hiring lots of people. It's one thing to hire a few. It's another thing to hire the many especially in an incredibly competitive market, even with what's happening with inflation. So what do they do? A lot of times they start with money because that's the most painful, but it's also the easiest. It's not just money. It's it's how do I deliver a better solution or a better work environment for my employee? And part of it is what we do. It's people need money when they want it. So while it used to be verboten you know, in the old days, you know, my family had a business and if somebody needed some money, my uncle would give them 20 bucks to cover them. 
I mean, in some ways, that concept of helping people make it from here to there went away because of the way we evolved in terms of how we pay people and the way in which you want to manage your your whole financial applications. But the idea of I need $20 today never went away. And and it's pronounced uh, probably even more so with people that are working because of inflation. So being able to pay them when they need to get paid, giving them a product that gives them flexibility uh, to use it in any way they want without having to go to a bank or having a bank account, having some controls around it, which help them start to think about how do I budget? How do I plan? We have a lot of probably a third or more of our cardholders have a bank account, but they use our product, you know, budget, put money aside, to use for only certain types of payments. And so consequently, that helps in, in becoming more financially astute. And I think that's important when you have a scarcity of income coming in, even if it's higher than it was. And as an employer, if I don't have more you know, kind of quivers uh, that I can use so that our arrows, so that I can actually get people, I'm just at a disadvantage. And so that's why our products help, I think, in positioning an employer as an employer of choice, but it's by no means the the only thing. There's, there's a lot of components to it. And I think employers are still struggling with what that magic combination would be for their particular business. And as you look inward at FinTwist and, and ComData, where do you see where do you see yourself headed and where are the biggest opportunities for you guys in the future? Well, I think it's uh, I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, <laughs> sounds like I, it. It definitely sounds yeah, like the it. Last, the last couple of years have been incredibly challenging, it, not just for us, for people that do what we do. There's you know, we have there's a lot of big companies that provide services that we meet with or, or or our partners with. And I think the whole concept of work, how do you work? How do people work? How do I get people to work, to do the work? How do I maintain productivity? How do I give people flexibility, particularly in jobs that I have to stand somewhere or be somewhere, whether it's an office or a restaurant or a hotel or you know a clean room? Those are challenging questions. Um, there's a lot of technology that's come out to help companies understand better analytics, to help companies understand how to put all that together. There's been a lot of people who opine on how do I structure the right programs and benefits like we talked about. So I think it's a really, you know, from a pure philosophical sit around and chat it up kind of thing. I think it's a very unique and interesting time, at least in my career of working. I think it's challenging, but but interesting. I think for us as a business is how do we continue to participate in that chain? How do we continue to either add product to our core and twist pay card solutions that can help employers with this hiring and retaining challenge or or opportunities for them to provide more uh, benefits to their employees or help educate their employees to be better at managing what they do get and continuing to push and encourage a little bit that they'll give them a little bit more because that is important. Um, but job satisfaction, uh, I, I'm sure you've seen these studies. I mean, pay is important, but oftentimes it's not even the top you know, two or three. Having an environment that they work in that creates satisfaction, whether that's some you know, work-life balance, whether that's the kind of job that they have, whether it's the ability to be promoted, whether that's the supervision that gives them a sense that they're accomplished. Um, and even in the last couple of years, particularly with Gen Z's, you know, a lot of them will tell you one of the most important things is what does my employer do? Are they good citizens? Do they do they give money to people? Do they support charities and causes? Do they let us participate in that? It's become something that, you know, I remember working at ADP many years ago. We had a giant United Way program and everybody contributed, and maybe there was one event, and that was it. That was all about giving and, and giving back, but nobody. If you ask one employee if that was important to them, whether they worked there or not, they would tell you probably no for most people. It was a nice thing to do, but it yeah. wasn't part of the work environment. Now it's you talk to people who are in their 20s and you know they'll say, Hey, what is what they want? They know more about what their employer does in that area than they do about the core business that a lot of times that their employer is even in. Well, the world's changed, and, and so part of it is for us to be able to deliver more solutions there. I think the idea of how do you take this on-demand product? How do, you, how do you engage it with employees in a way that they're smart, they use it when they need it? 
Um, and they use it in a way that helps them in their life. I think we'll continue to evolve and, and being capable of responding to changes at the federal regulation and state payroll regulation level, which is going to happen because the there's always questions about how people do things. And in this industry, I don't even want to call them bad actors. I would say they're people that are working on the periphery or are extending some of these regulations to fit their model in a way that I don't know if that will continue. And, and, and I think it will change. And what will that look like? And make sure that we're always ahead of that. You know, we're a big public company. We don't, um, you know, I like to think that my business is really important and it is, but we got a lot of other businesses. And so we're not going to do things. Uh, we're going to be conservative. We're going to do things in a way that we think is the most consistent with what the people that regulate regulate us think we should do. Some other people, if you're backed by a venture firm or a private equity firm and you got to grow really quickly, you have a, maybe have a different view of how do you grow and, and maybe deal with some of the consequences later. So I think that's another part. The last thing would be, you know, we do more than just uh, pay cards. You know, we provide other programs to to clients. Um, we do a whole bunch of corporate disbursement programs, which would be more akin to the types of programs that would probably fall more uh, under someone who's doing product, but also we deal with a lot of CFOs and a lot of controllers around um, these types of programs. For example, we have a very large blood plasma company that that provides um, you know donation services, and we handle all their payments to the, their consumers. Um, and so for our business, the way I always think about it relative, let's say, to our corporate payments businesses, the end, in the end, it's a human being that's using our product, whether it's someone who donated blood, whether that's a W-2, whether that's a 1099 who's working on a variety of jobs, whether that's a gig worker, they're they're holding a product in their hand that says fin to us, whether they're using our mobile application, whether they're using the card, whether they're going to our web application. We're, we are dealing with people in our business, which is a bit different than most of the other businesses within Fleet Corps because we're more of an enterprise type solution, a B2B kind of business. We're B2B to C and, and frankly, the consumers, what drives satisfaction, the consumers, what, how we make any money and the consumers are who we ultimately deal with pretty much on a day-to-day basis because once we set the programs up, it's the consumers calling us, it's calling our call center, it's using our product. It's very rarely conversations with employers unless we're adding more or changing something. So building out more of those kinds of solutions, being able to provide those, whether it's domestically or even looking at some international op- applications, I think it's probably the uh, the next step for us as we continue to grow the business. And last question, if our listeners remember just one thing from this conversation, what would you want it to be? Besides you being a wonderful host? <laughs> well, thank you. I think it's really that the world is changing, how people work, how employers, and the, when I say employers, obviously, you know, we work for a company, it's that's an entity, it's just illegal, it's the people. You know, in our case, it's usually heads of HR, senior HR people, business owners. On the financial side, it's usually the controller level who who ultimately is the the, the straight line to the head of payroll, particularly with the larger enterprises that we deal with. It's those people understanding the world's changing, understanding how the workforce is changing in a way that they need to respond. And that I believe that we here with ComData and FinTwist, we have ways in which we can help them meet the changing needs of their business and their workforce. But also we have a lot of people that are dealing with these same problems across as I said, primarily or, or quite a bit in the industries that where our product is mostly used. And we have a lot of lessons learned. We have a lot of knowledge that um, not specific to a company per se, but how people are doing things well, best practices. And when you're dealing with change, which is super scary, whether it's personal, like, hey, my son graduated from college and now what's he going to do? To, hey, I've got 100 maids, they got to hire in 20 locations, or I'm conceptually going to lose some business or drive down customer satisfaction. I think we have ways in which we can help people do that. We can give them best practices as well as provide the the technology and service that goes along with with the FinTwist uh, business itself. I think that's the most important thing is that we, we can help. We have products that can help. We have people that can help. 
and that in general, the world's changing and you got to stay ahead of it or suddenly you're going to be behind. Yeah. Change is definitely not going away. And it seems like it's coming at us faster and faster every year. Absolutely. Totally agree. So as I said, it's a little scary, but you know, it, it can be. It's sure. Halloween, Halloween's coming up anyway. So you know, you're getting in ready for, uh, for another 12 days. Get your pumpkins and your candy. Yeah. And change just is uh, a chance for an opportunity to emerge. So absolutely. Absolutely. Brian, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you so much for having us. And then if people are interested to learn more about uh, what we do with best place to go would be www.fintwistsolutions.com. That's fintwistsolutions, all word, uh, one word, dot com. And there's a lot of information about our solutions, what we do, how we do it. And it's a good place to start and, um, and learn about whether this uh, might be some things we could provide some of uh, your listeners. And it's been great uh, catching up and I hope uh, people were able to take something beneficial from our conversation. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. And I wish you and FinTwist Solutions all the best. Sounds like you're both doing amazing things. And to all of our listeners, please tune in next week. And until then, take care. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personiv. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personiv can do for you by visiting personiv.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personiv. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personive.com. Thanks for listening.